today's going to be just an awesome time. We're going to have a wealth of knowledge um, and just a beautiful time learning about the feminine genius. Um, if you can come up someone, I'm going to say a little prayer for all of us, just to open our hearts and minds and also for her. So, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, thank you, God, for um, your presence here today. Thank you for your faithfulness to us, and thank you for guiding and making this possible to have a, a talk here at the Newman Center. I just, I bless Simone um, in her talk. I pray the Holy Spirit would be on her lips, Lord God, that everything that comes from her is from you. I pray that you would open the hearts and minds of all the men and women here, and all those watching um, that something would touch their heart, Lord God, so they can encounter you in a mighty way and that we can learn how to love authentically um, from the cross and through your love. In your holy name, Jesus, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Jen. That entire bio is completely made up. Um, <laughs> um, all right, well, it's a it's a true pleasure to be here with all of you. I love Jen, so the, lo the love is mutual, and uh, looking forward to getting to know all of you. Also, my colleague, Laura Zambrana, is here with her new baby, so if you have questions about Endow after, um, you can also, also talk to her. Uh, the talk uh, this morning is gonna be divided into uh, the past, the present, and the future. So we're gonna look at authentic femininity through a historical lens, the past, the present, and the future, okay? Um, so I'll just start off pretty blunt that historically women have gotten the short end of the stick, okay? Um, and why is that? Why is it that, that that's kind of on our hearts and minds, that, that women talk to me sometimes privately, sometimes publicly, and say like, don't you feel like we're getting the short end of the stick here? Uh, and, and, and explaining that is a long story, but here's what Dr. Alice von Hildebrand points out to us in her book, the privilege of being a woman. She says that since the beginning, all the way back to the book of Genesis, the one deadly enemy of the evil one is the woman. Because she, Eve, has been named mother of the living. Okay, so this is the heart of our privilege as women. Uh, and because we have this great capacity to bear children, uh, we are especially hated and attacked by the enemy, okay? Uh, so the nature of spiritual warfare has taken women as its touchstone, um, as its touchstone. Um, after Adam and Eve both committed the original sin and fell from grace, God explains, he, he's explaining what's going to happen, right? The now heightened drama of this hatred that existed before the fall. And this is, of course, in Genesis 3, verse 15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Okay, so this is, this is the nature of, of our spiritual attack, the spiritual warfare. Uh, so then we fast forward in this battle, in this war, to the new Eve, which is the Blessed Virgin Mary, who is also the mother of the living, but this time, not merely on a natural level, but she is the mother of the living on a supernatural level. Okay, she's not just the biological mother of Jesus, our Lord and Messiah, she also belongs to all of us as our spiritual mother. So then now we, we have uh, a supernatural privilege, okay, as women, the capacity to allow our authentic femininity to express itself as spiritual mothers. Um, in other words, very simply put, what does it mean to be, what does it mean, what does authentic femininity mean? What does spiritual motherhood mean? What it means very simply is that we generate life in the souls of other people, okay? Uh, Pope St. John Paul II said that Our Lady is the highest expression of the feminine genius because there's no creature, there's no creature that generates more life in our souls than this woman. He also said uh, in a meeting in 1987 to the Roman Curia, so if you just picture Picture the Holy Father in the Vatican, looking at a sea of men, you know, sea of clerics, and he begins the session in 1987 saying, all this is possible because of a woman. All this is possible because of it. All of salvation history is possible because one woman said yes to God's plan. And then as we know, because I'm sure everybody here is a JP2 fan, uh, that he dedicates his entire pontificate to the power of the feminine vocation. When he chose his papal motto to be totus tuus, Mary, I'm totally yours, as a sign of his fidelity to Our Lady. Isn't it fascinating that 
the, literally the highest patriarch of the church dedicates his pontificate to femininity, okay? Um, so this is why historically women have gotten the short end of the stick, because it is the privilege of authentic femininity to generate life and a culture of life, okay? So now, that's the past past. Uh, now let's look at the first century Rome, okay? Um, and, and examine the witness of early Christian women in the first century, okay? The feminine genius is the method of the church. The feminine genius is the method of the church. In fact, we refer to the church as the bride of Christ. Uh, we refer to her as mater et magistra. She's mother and she's teacher, okay? So all the images of the church, we have the Petrine image named after St. Peter, which represents the institutional patriarchal image of the church. Okay, we have the Pauline image of the church after St. Paul, uh, which is the evangelical missionary image of the church. Okay, we have the Joannine image of the church. These are von Balthasar's categories, right? Which is the contemplative mystical image of the church. Um, all of those images subsist under the most foundational image of the church, which is the Marian dimension of the church. And that is the dimension that takes precedence because the character of the Marian dimension is that it's total receptivity and total surrender to God. So St. Peter, St. Paul, St. John, all of those images of the church, all those masculine images of the church, all, the, all of them find their, uh, again, that touchstone in the Marian, in the receptive. Um, German writer Gertrude von Lefort wrote that wherever a woman is most profoundly herself, she is also bride and she is also mother. So women are a threat because women represent life, love, relationship, and union. John Paul II wrote, and I love how blunt he is because it gives me permission to be really blunt too. <laughs> Perhaps more than men, women acknowledge the person because they see persons with their hearts. Okay, sorry for the guys in the room, you're great. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. And so um, the past is very, very consoling to me um, because when I think about and no, no one here is a stranger to the cultural horrors of a culture of death going on in our culture right now. Right. Um, we all know what's happening uh, to terrible degrees. No need to go into it. Um, but what's amazing to me about history is that if what happened in the first century can happen and it happened beginning with women, then we still have a shot, of course we do, of what happened in the first century happening now through cultivating authentic femininity. Okay, so what happened? Um, briefly, St. Mary Magdalene, the first evangelizer, because she was the first to witness the resurrection. So she runs to the apostles and proclaims, I have seen the Lord. Okay, Mary Magdalene, because of this singular distinction, the church has elevated her feast day to the same status as the 12 apostles. How cool is that? She's the only woman that has status in the liturgical calendar like an apostle. And the church has given her the title apostle to the apostles, right? So anytime I hear women complain they can't be priests or bishops, I'm like, Mary Magdalene was the apostle to the apostle. <laughs> you know, uh, what a greater privilege than that. Uh, because she is, the church says, the testis divine misericordiae, the first witness to the divine mercy, okay? John Paul II writes that the contribution of authentic femininity is primarily spiritual and cultural in nature, okay? It's a primarily spiritual and cultural reality and contribution. And this is absolutely true in the case of Mary Magdalene. Okay, so unlike the apostles, again, sorry guys, who were scared and hiding, worried about the Jews, worried about political retribution for being disciples of Jesus, she was absolutely fearless and went running to the tomb and focused solely on Jesus, right? Primarily spiritual, primarily cultural. So Christians, beginning with women, were, as Mike Aquilina, church historian says, they were the salt of the empire, okay? Uh, remember, Christians were first persecuted by the Jews and then starting in 64 AD, beginning with Nero, persecuted all the way until 313 AD. Okay, so that's longer than the United States has been a country where Jews system, or where Christians systematically persecuted in the Roman Empire, okay? Um, and the situation for Christians was bad. Uh, the situation for Christian women was even worse, okay? Women had no legal rights, no property rights, and in fact were considered the property of either their fathers or their husbands. Okay, so it's not surprising then that the first majority of converts to the Catholic Church were women, okay? 
And you know how the story goes. It's a tale as old as time. When women convert, men follow. Okay? Uh, so what happens next? Women convert, men follow, they get married, happy, you know, happy families, Christian babies. Okay? The early Christians were, of course, pro-life. And unlike the Romans, they didn't contracept, they didn't commit infanticide, they didn't commit abortions. They rejected a homosexual lifestyle as well as pedophilia, and it started with women. Then what happens? Okay, so pagans and famines hit, and Christian families not only take care of their own families, but they take care of their pagan neighbors who were abandoned by their own families. So no one needed a Catholic social justice, Catholic social teaching course. They had, or, they had radically encountered the love of God, and they knew how to express that love to strangers and to their enemies. So what happens next? So then the pagans convert, of course. Why? Because of the happiness that they witnessed and the life and the love they encountered from their Christian neighbors. And this is the same today. We can have our intellectual conversions, right? We can be cradle Catholics, but what really keeps us in is the community and it's the joy and the happiness that radiates from living a beautiful Christian life. Um, so in the midst of the culture of death where the faith was illegal, where being and converting to the faith meant martyrdom, torture, the conversion rates were staggeringly high, okay? There is so much more to this story, obviously, um, because I'd love to go into the significance of St. Agnes, how her martyrdom was a turning point in the way that the Romans treated the Christians, uh, the incredible stories of St. Perpetua and Felicity. Um, so if you're interested in going deeper into the story of the early Christian women, um, please check out Mike Aquilina's book, The Witness of Early Christian Women. Um, I also have a podcast on the Undow podcast on it if you want to get a little teaser. I think you'll love that podcast. Um, so let me just end part one, okay, with this. That the sexual revolution of the first century was consecrated virginity, was consecrated celibacy. And that was true women's liberation in the first century, okay? So a complete, miraculous, uh, truly spiritual and cultural conversion of the empire well before Christianity was legalized in 313 um, and well before Christianity was the official state religion, which didn't happen until 380 AD. All right, with me? Part one? Great. Part two, let's talk about the present. Um, and by the present, I mean the 20th century, okay? Um, Pope John Paul II called the 20th century, and this is in a letter he wrote to his friend, the theologian Henri de Lubac, he said that it was, the 20th century was an anthropological mess, okay? Um, he said that the pulverization of the human person, right? What, what kind of vulgar language, right? The complete pulverization of the human person was due to this philosophical error, okay, about the meaning of the human person, okay? I love, well, he's a philosopher, right? But if we want to understand everything that's going on in our culture, we have to trace it back to the ideas, to the to philosophy, okay? Because good philosophy, there's nothing more practical than good philosophy. There's nothing more dangerous than bad philosophy. So if we want to like be cultural, like run cultural diagnostics, what's the bad idea that took root in the hearts and minds of people, and how is it being expressed, okay? So he said, all right, here's here's the problem. We have dignity and value simply because we exist. This idea is a Christian idea. It's a totally Christian idea because we're made in God's image and likeness. John Paul II all recognized that those in power, and of course he's referring primarily to the Nazis and the communists that he lived under, you know, um, that they were bad philosophers, okay? They got the human person wrong. Uh, because we're not just material beings of flesh, but we're spiritual beings ordered to a relationship with God. We're not only our souls, uh, and we're not only our bodies. We are body-soul composites. So if you ever hear anybody saying, oh, I have a body. No, you are your body. You are your soul. That is good philosophy, okay? So our dignity doesn't come from how much money we make or have, how much pleasure we're able to attain for ourselves, how powerful or popular we are, and certainly not, and this is what, of course, we witnessed in the 20th century, certainly not by how useful or economically valuable we are to the state or to the government, okay? So the 20th century, until today, of course, is in a total crisis of identity and dignity, okay? But the heart of this crisis is the crisis of authentic femininity, okay? Because if there weren't a crisis, 
we so totally wouldn't be having a Saturday morning talk on authentic femininity. <laughs> right? Uh, but this is like a counterterrorism meeting, okay? Um, sorry, I'm Middle Eastern, so everything is like, you know, how are we going to strategize? Okay, counterterrorism. Um, right? How are we going to mobilize to build up and cultivate authentic femininity, knowing that it's the most powerful cultural game changer, and that will also change the masculine, and it will change everything, okay? So um, what does it mean to be a woman, all right? Um, the 20th century gifted us with the life of a profound and prophetic woman who thought, wrote, lectured, and prayed about this, and of course, you probably have already guessed, her name's St. Edith Stein, okay? Um, Edith Stein dealt with atheism, depression, Racism, sexism, Nazism. That's a lot for one life, okay? That's a lot for one woman. Uh, she lost her Jewish faith at the age of 14. She said she just fell out, literally stopped praying. What's incredible to me about the age that she left her Jewish faith is that that's the average age that Catholics lose their faith, 13 and 14, okay? Um, she went through a period of depression. Uh, the story of how she was healed of her depression is fascinating because uh, it largely had to do with listening to the music of Bach, okay? Uh, I have a podcast on that, too. All right. Uh, <laughs> she became a philosopher, which, of course, at the time was a really big deal because philosophy was a serious business, so it was, it was a man's field, so I don't know what the ladies were wanting to do about it, right? Uh, but her mom really pushed her and supported her to, to, to follow her desire, and she, she studied philosophy. Um, and even though she proved herself brilliant, okay, her, her, her mentor was actually the founder of the German philosophical movement called Phenomenology. She was a phenomenologist. You might know that John Paul II also was a phenomenologist as well as a Thomist. Getting too complicated here, but the point is, um, the point is he thought she was brilliant. She worked for him, he mentored her. He said, you know, yeah, you're overqualified. I'm paraphrasing, right? You're overqualified, you should be teaching university, but you're a woman, so I don't know about it, right? Um, ouch, okay, so, <laughs> First, because she was a woman, and then later she didn't get a professorship because she was Jewish. Hard times, okay? And of course, in the end, uh, despite the fact that she converted to the Catholic faith, right, because philosophy can only go so far, this is what St. Thomas says, the beginning of the Summa, right? This is why do we need sacred doctrine and sacred theology? Well, because let's just say we all have the time to philosophize all day. It's really hard. We probably get it wrong anyway, so good thank god for theology thank god jesus revealed himself to us because it's a little complicated to figure it all out philosophically so at the end of her philosophical study she has a conversion to the catholic faith and she has a vocation to become a carmelite nun she becomes sister wow. Teresa, blessed by the cross okay um Teresa benedicta acruce okay and then uh of course even though she was a convert and a nun she was still sent to the concentration camps of auschwitz birkenau and gas, she was gassed in the gas chamber, uh, August 9th, 1942, at the age of 50, okay? But while she was living her lay Catholic life, before entering the convent and saying yes to the contemplative vocation, she wrote essays on women, okay? Which is a really nice synthesis of her teachings on the nature and the concept of women, okay? So if you really wanna delve into this authentic femininity thing, read, Read her essays on women. We also have an endowed study on Edith Stein. All right. Uh, her biographer, Waltrid Herbstrith, wrote that her work on femininity can be synthesized in this idea. This is what he says. That a woman's mature Christian life is the source of healing for the world. I'll say that again. A woman's mature Christian life is the source of healing for the world. Here's, here's Edith Stein in her own words. Women must become broad, tranquil, emptied of self, warm, and transparent. Only hearts that are emptied and silent can be penetrated by grace with its power to form women into the loving persons they are intended to be. Before they can be ready to assist others, women first need to be securely anchored in their own depths. In other words, Without being deeply rooted in the Lord, the genius of women is compromised. And now I want to share with you Edith's differentiation. This is gonna be fun for the this is gonna be fun for a co group. Uh, differentiation of the masculine and feminine characteristics. Okay, here's what she says about positive femininity. Okay, women have a tendency towards union, 
dedication towards developing others to completion, orientation towards the concrete whole person, and a special capacity for empathy. Okay, so I think we know women care about relationship, uh, really care about helping other people in a holistic way. Did you eat? Did you nap? Did you do a snap? Right? Like, <laughs> grandma. Um, <laughs> I'm fine. Oh, yeah. Uh, orientation towards the whole person and a special capacity for empathy, right? I remember calling my priest boss, right? And I, I was like, because I was teaching high school, you know, and I was like, the children need so much, you know? And he's like, you need to go home and have a life. I'm like, <laughs> got it. Masculine genius helpful. Um, here's what Edith says about the negative, uh, the, the feminine genius gone too far. Okay. I don't want to say toxic femininity, but I'll say it. Uh, urge to lose the self in another human being. Too much curiosity about others. What? <laughs> Placing too much emphasis on self or family. An inability to accept criticism without seeing it as an attack. Never. Okay. <laughs> and the inability to accept. Uh, yeah, I read that part. All right. Here's what she says about men, about the masculine. Tendency towards detachment. Dedication to discipline. Orientation towards specialization. Special capacity for objectivity. Here's what she says about the negative aspects of the masculine. Toxic masculine. Brutal despotism over others, especially women. Enslavement to work. Atrophy of one's humanity. Degeneracy of too much abstraction. Okay, I remember my friend Mark, who in college was just a broke college kid, would buy a bunch of McDonald's hamburgers, put them in the freezer, and then every day defrost them on the windowsill. <laughs> That's what I thought of when I read Atrophy of One's Humanity. <laughs> wow, guys. All right, so, so you see here, in a certain sense, we can't exactly discuss authentic femininity without the same time understanding something of authentic masculinity, okay? So complementarity is key to not only understanding sexual difference, but flourishing and expressing feminine genius. If you are a woman, you need the masculine genius to fully flourish. Uh, if you are a man, you need the feminine genius to fully flourish, okay? Um, in other words, we need each other to be ourselves. It's not good that man be alone. It's not good that woman be alone, okay? Um, here's what another Teresa, this time Mother Teresa, she says about it. I do not understand why some people are saying that women and men are exactly the same and are denying the beautiful differences between men and women. All God's gifts are good, but they are not all the same. As I often say to people who tell me they would like to serve the poor as I do, what I can do, you cannot, and what you can do, I cannot. But together we can do something beautiful for God. It is just this way with the differences between women and men. So we can do something beautiful for God together. One of my favorite examples of complementarity, and I think, I think many of us are probably very familiar with like Francis de Sales and St. Jane de Chantel and Francis of Assisi and St. Clair and all these like beautiful saintly examples of complementarity. Edith Stein and John Paul II is another example of it because as I mentioned, she had all these obstacles to pursuing her personal vocation as, a, as an academic, as a contemplative, as a Catholic. Um, and so she had, she prophesied and she had an intuition and she said, um, I think there's somebody that's gonna come after me that's gonna develop the thought that I have proposed. Um, and that someone else uh, turned out to be none other than John Paul II. Um, not bad, Edith. All right, uh, so we're gonna turn now to part three, the future, okay? So the dignity of woman is a value and a top priority of the Catholic Church. Obviously the secular world doesn't get that and many in the Catholic Church don't get that, okay? When I share with people, it's really awkward, Laura understands this, when people are like, what do you do? I'm like, oh, I educate on the nature and dignity of women. Um, yeah, it's a thing. Anyway, uh, people are just like, oh, the Catholics care about women. Uh, my optometrist has said that to me. I mean, people are just shamelessly rude about Catholics. Uh, I'm like, we don't have time to get into it, but. <laughs> Here's 
a podcast. All right. Um, so there, there's, there's actually, this is incredible. There's no organization uh, more pro-woman than the Catholic Church. Um, and the work of the new evangelization, right? And the new evangelization, you know, people are always excited about it. For me, it makes me a little depressed. Because the new evangelization means that Christians themselves don't know the gospel. Right? The popes are like, hey, guess what? We've got to reencounter the Lord. Um, and so anyway, not, not to burst anybody's bubble, but it's kind of sad, right? Uh, Ratzinger says that, you know, um, we're, our century is characterized by the phenomenon of people who are incapable of relating to God, right? And he's saying that to Christians, okay? And he's also said how far we are from a world in which people no longer need to be taught about God because he's so present in their midst, okay? Um, ouch. Okay, but John Paul II also calls for a new feminism. Along with the new evangelization is a new feminism, okay? So following his predecessor, Pope Paul VI, and if you haven't read it yet, there's an incredible, incredible uh, closing message that he wrote, that he proclaimed to women at the end of the Second Vatican Council, okay? So we know the Second Vatican Council is an ecumenical council. How are we gonna evangelize in a modern world? We have all this amazing truth. Um, how, do, how do we translate that and make it something accessible to a century that's characterized by people incapable of relating to God? Um, and so he closes the Second Vatican Council with this message uh, to women. Um, John Paul II uh, takes up Pope Paul the sixth call um, and he does that I mean, there's several places where the church discusses the feminine genius but for John Paul the second the two key documents are Mulier Stigatatum which is an apostolic letter he wrote in 1988 on the dignity and vocation of women and then in 1995 he writes a pastoral letter to women which he writes to all women of the world uh, which is really cool because back in May my friend, my Egyptian friend, had me FaceTime uh, randomly with a, with a girl in Morocco who was leaving her Islamic faith. And, um, and he said, you want to talk to her about Jesus? I'm like, yeah. Uh, and she starts off by asking me about the Trinity and the hypostatic union. I'm like, really? <laughs> okay. But then she said, what, is, what do Christians think about women? And I was like, oh, John Paul II, thank you so much for writing Six Pages to Women. Because I could be like, here, read it. He wrote it for you, literally. All right. Um, and this is, this, is, this is what John Paul, so this is John Paul II now quoting Paul VI. He says, and we're, talk, we're talking about the future. The hour is coming. So he's prophesying. The hour is coming, in fact, has come. When the vocation of women is being acknowledged in its fullness. The hour in which women acquire in the world an influence, an effect, and a power never hitherto achieved. That is why at this moment, when the human race is undergoing so deep a transformation, women imbued with the spirit of the gospel can do so much to aid humanity in not falling. Okay. If you don't want to read that letter, uh, Pope Paul VI, I've got it on the Endow podcast. My dream is that it goes viral. All right. Uh, you know, all, all women hearing, hearing the Pope tell them how important they are and how needed they are. Okay. This is what John Paul II says in his letter to women about the future. Women will increasingly play a part in the solution of the serious problems of the future. Leisure time, quality of life, migration, social services, euthanasia, drugs, healthcare, and ecology. In all these areas, a greater presence of women in society will prove most valuable. For it will help to manifest the contradictions present when society is organized solely according to the criteria of efficiency and productivity. It will force systems to be redesigned in a way which favors the processes of humanization which mark the civilization of love. In his letter, John Paul II praises the first wave of the feminist movement, which happened in the 19th and early 20th century. Okay voting rights for women, uh, property ownership, educational opportunities, right? But first wave feminists also opposed abortion, promoted traditional marriage and motherhood and the temperance movement, okay? But it's the emergence of the second and third wave feminist movements, which calls, which prompts John Paul II to call for a new feminism, to call for renewal and revival in the feminist movement, okay? Because in second wave feminism, um, 
you know, the those key players denied the good of marriage, supported contraception and abortion, and promiscuity. Okay, uh, in third wave feminism, which is the 1980s and 90s, feminists promote gender ideology. Gender is distinct from biological sex and therefore fluid and socially constructed, as we're all very well aware of what's going on now. Um, and therefore, a rejection of the radical objective sexual difference. Okay. Behind all these movements, there are two questions that haunt us, especially for women. One, how do we talk about these things without becoming stereotypical? Okay. Um, how am I supposed to live? What am I supposed to do? How as a woman am I supposed to survive in a culture that hates women so much? Okay. Um, so let's start with the first question about avoiding stereotypes. Okay. Edith Stein spoke of women having both feminine and masculine characteristics and men of having both masculine and feminine characteristics. Uh, philosopher Dr. John Kudvak in his Men and Women of the Household course, which uh, is really cool if you're newly married, engaged, want to be married, everybody. Men and Women in the Household course, check it out, okay? Great philosopher. Um, I also have a podcast on it. Okay, and, uh, <laughs> and in, in, in it, what Dr. John Kudvak uh, discusses is that um, when we talk about men as the head of the household, right? Um, what do, how do we talk about that without sounding like people woke culture people you know hate right um we're catholics we have an incredible intellectual tradition we can talk about things in a nuanced brilliant and intelligent way we don't have to be stereotypical okay but he says that it is an example of one of the many points is that in a household it is common that the wife and the woman will have better ideas than her husband so how is a man supposed, what does it mean, well, I'm in charge, so I can take your ideas into consideration. How, how is he supposed to navigate that? And so Dr. Cudbag says that it's men's jobs to take first responsibility, right? And what this does is it decreases the competition between men and women and allows for a more nuanced cultivation of the characteristics of the masculine and feminine within the other. So, like I was saying with my priest boss, who was like, go home, right? Um, he was kind of forcing me into detachment, right? Which is not my natural feminine state, right? Um, I, God willing, in, at the, actually, I did this at the school once. When I could, like, you know, feminine intuition. I was like, I feel like a teacher down the hall is going to have a nervous breakdown. Uh, <laughs> so I was like, no, 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 hi, father. Um, I think you need to say, like, a priestly hello, you know, to teacher down the hall. He's like, Crazy. That teacher did have a mental breakdown that day. I shouldn't say that with a smile because I was right about it. Um, but I mean, so there, so there, it's not like, oh, now I'm the detached one. Now I'm the one that cares about people, right? It's that the other draws out the quality of the other, and that for a man to take first responsibility is to take up his wife's good ideas and to make it his own, and to make it his own. John Paul II has a slightly different take on take than Edith Stein. He emphasizes in his letter the mystery of a woman and the mystery of her vocation. So he doesn't speak in a way that attributes certain characteristics to men as either feminine or masculine or to women. Um, but he says that feminine is the way a woman acts in the world and masculine is the way that a man acts in the world. Okay. There's a lot more to this, obviously. So you've got to do your own deep study, uh, you know, to kind of build your own vocabulary and understanding and intelligence so that if and when you get into those conversations with people who are radically opposed to, to the Christian proposal for anthropology, um, you, you will have something fascinating and interesting to, to propose to them. Um, you're not, you're, you can't be just put in that annoying Christian box, okay? Uh, what strikes me about what John Paul II is proposing is that the feminine genius not only has characteristics which prioritize being over doing, but the very presence of a woman itself is a provocation for recalibration of progress towards the spiritual. Her very presence is a, is a recalibration, is a call for recalibration. Um, there's a really cute story about how this plays out, but I can't, oh, actually it's not cute, it's very powerful. Uh, Father Keith Kenny will often say, quoting 
some French theologian that the reason why the early church was so holy and converted so many is because Our Lady was present there. Mm -hmm. Just her presence was a provocation to holiness and to sanctity. And so the second question is, what does it mean for me to live out my authentic femininity? Um, so first, as I mentioned, we need men to live it well for women and vice versa. Uh, John Paul II writes, the masculine genius is in service to the feminine genius. Uh, and we see this most dramatically expressed in um, the providentially exclusively male ministerial priesthood. Um, and in the feminine genius, we find in, in Mary, the high secret, we find the ideal. Um, I had a girl who, 20 something, was a millennial, who heard my podcast on women priests and she wrote on Instagram, oh, this is upsetting and I don't like it. Um, I, I, don't, I don't like it. Uh, so I was like, ooh, someone's mad. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> so we ended up having a Zoom meeting and she had all her points after listening. Here, here's what I don't like. I said, this is great. This is the beginning of a lifelong education, you know? And so we started with Letter to Women. I said, just start reading Letter to Women. And so she leaves me a little voice note and she says, um, cause I can give strangers my cell phone number. Uh, and she, she said, so, so John Paul II is like thanking women for being women, simply for being women. I don't want thank yous, I want apologies, you know? And I was like, keep reading. Because uh, what does he do in the next section? He starts apologizing. He starts apologizing when the masculine genius has failed to be in service of the feminine genius. Uh, one of the best arguments, this isn't very philosophical, but I think it resonates with best arguments uh, for women not being priests is, well, from Suzanne Wolfe. I don't know if you know, she's a Catholic writer. Um, or she's a, a writer who is a Catholic, not a Catholic writer per se. And she's like, women are, she's British, she's like, women are already priests, we're already sacrificing, we don't need another thing, you know? Uh, and I, I love that. All right, it's so true. All right, second, uh, so John Paul II, he avoids two extremes when it comes to the role of women in the world, okay? On the one hand, he avoids the extreme that says biological motherhood, while of singular importance, is the only aspect of woman, the only aspect of woman that gives her life meaning and value. Strong women, wives, and mothers are crucial in the home, but women are also desperately needed in the public sphere. Uh, so he, public square. So he says that, and he says this in Evangelium Vitae, which is also in 1995. He says that first, women have to avoid imitating men. Be women, don't be men. Um, and second, um, second, he says that uh, we have to create a society that doesn't economically depend on women who are working because of the prioritization and the dignity of the home. But again, he avoids the other extreme by saying, but at the same time, we need more and more feminine influence in the public square. Can we be the sort of people that can live with that tension? Or do we have to become ideological about it, right? Because we do judge each other. We do judge the working mom. We do judge the stay at home mom. We do, right, we, we judge all the time. Instead of just saying, well, maybe that woman is called to what she's called to. And I can trust that she's following the voice of the Lord and doing what she needs to do. So we have to follow, follow Mother Church in allowing for these tensions to exist. And the tension being the drama of each individual woman's life. Okay, so he not only acknowledges the reality, but encourages the feminine genius to be present increasingly in all areas. Okay, and that if they're in all areas, their very presence will become that spiritual and cultural recalibration, that provocation, okay? And, you know, so what are you gonna do? What are we gonna do? We just have, we have to cultivate our personal vocations, right? Uh, which is another way of saying, who are you, right? So when Edith says, if you wanna be, a, I'm gonna paraphrase, if you wanna be a spiritual mother, you have to be deeply rooted in your depths. You have to be deeply rooted in Jesus, okay? So, um, this whole conversation about women and what a woman is that we see in our culture, it, it just, it wouldn't even be possible without Jesus, right? Because God's entrance into the world and the way he radically and counterculturally treated women and revealed their dignity to them, it totally changed history, okay? And it's the only reason we can have this debate in our culture, this weird, strange, demented, often demonic debate, right? But the only reason we can have it at all is because Jesus of Nazareth entered history and looked at looked women in the eyes and said, "You have dignity," mm -hmm. and we became and we realized we were persons, not property. Okay, here's Alice von Hildebrand. Okay, 
cheering us on, cheering on the cultivation of authentic femininity and masculinity. She says, the devil is clever and we are stupid. He knows full well that if he can destroy femininity, he can destroy the church, marriage, and the family. And it's all in the hands of a woman. Here's how John Paul II concludes his letter to women. The life of the church in the third millennium will certainly not be lacking in new and surprising manifestations of the feminine genius. In other words, as Edith Stein would say, no woman is just a woman. So whatever obstacles to living out your feminine vocation might be, if you're a woman in here, right, take heart in figures of the early church women, as well as St. Edith Stein, who didn't let any of society's blocks get in the way of her becoming a saint. Okay, and um, the subject of healing is often one of my favorite things to talk about, but truly our wounds become our weapons. Your sufferings become your glory. This is the paradox about the reality of the Christian faith, what St. Paul says in Romans, that God is working out all things for the good for those who love him. So Edith Stein had the choice to become a victim of sexism, of racism, of all these horrible things. Instead, she didn't play the victim card. She became a spiritual mother and she became a saint. And the stories of the way that she acted in the concentration camps are absolutely glorious. One of the Dutch officials who was watching her care for the children of the women who couldn't care for their own children because they were so distraught because being in Auschwitz is traumatizing, right? And he said she walked and talked and acted like a saint and she really was one. So when we are discerning our personal vocations, either as men or women, we have a choice. We have a choice to either use uh, the attacks that the evil one throws in our faces and become victims, or those precisely become, as Pope Francis says, the privileged places of encounter, of mercy, and also a hint toward your personal vocation. In other words, who you are. Because your personal vocation is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Not your state in life, not who you marry, not what religious order you're a part of. Your personal vocation is you, okay? Um, so Our Lady brings us back full circle as our inspiration is the highest expression of the feminine genius. Um, therefore, as women, we can correctly understand all of ourselves as mothers of the living. Okay, and again, I, I don't wanna to be too depressing with church statistics, but for every one convert we gain, we lose six. 50% of Catholics leave the church at some point in their life. Most of them leave by 23, and the average age is 13. We leave mothers, <laughs> okay. So um, I'm gonna end with, I, I hope I kept time. Uh, just, just some questions that you can, you can pray with uh, before we go into Q&A. Does my self-talk, inner narrative, and actions manifest God's glory? Do I really believe I'm intrinsically valuable and unconditionally loved? In what ways does my behavior reflect a lack of dignity toward myself? Do I allow myself to be exploited or objectified in any way? Am I kind to myself? Do I allow myself to receive kindness and tenderness from the Lord? Do I allow for holy interruptions in my day? Do I consistently choose the personal and particular as opposed to the productive and efficient? Does my presence elevate humanity, the humanity of my environments? Do I experience masculinity, if you're a woman, as a threat to my femininity? Or do I experience masculinity as complementary, as the azer, which is Hebrew for helper, to my life? Am I tempted to imitate models of male domination? What is the running narrative by which I live my day? What is my motivational drive? Do I have my priorities in line with my spiritual values? Do I see everyone and everything as a gift? What has the kingdom cost me? What has being a spiritual daughter demanded of me? Do I see myself as a spiritual mother? And what is my vision for myself? And what is my vision for the future? Thank you so much. Oh, that's amazing. Um, what a great question. Well, be manly. Um, <laughs> but also, I would say, um, 
I really do believe, and this is not just because I work in Endow, I really do believe in the value of studying things, on, studying the writings of John Paul II, The Feminine Genius, because there's such an onslaught of assault on women. Um, and we know, as Joan of Arc says, that battles begin and end in the mind. So your mind isn't constantly being fed with the truth about your dignity and who you are. It's really easy with television, with social media, with all that stuff, right? We're all formed by our culture, whether we agree with it or not, we're formed by it. So we have to be like counter-terrorists. And I think studying the writings of, of John Paul II on the feminine genius and having those kind of conversations um, are really important. I also think, I don't know how a man would do this, but like, I think, um, talking about humana vitae and contraception and contraceptive mentality because that is the feminist that's the sexual revolution's strongest thing is the entrance of the birth control pill into our lives um so reading reading uh, pope paul the sixth prophetic document on humana vitae um not just because we don't we don't want and it doesn't work anyway right just saying like here are the church's rules you can stick to them or find a loophole or just kind of ignore them but to understand like the deep philosophy behind why the church teaches what she does and and painting that vision and that beauty i think is really important and if a man initiates that not just like girls encouraging girls but like if a man <laughs> initiates it right because i'll tell you this my modesty conversion didn't come from my mother um, it didn't come from my annoying girlfriends who were like, your skirt's too short. Um, it came from a man who said, you're a really good girl. Sometimes you don't dress like that. I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm from LA. Everyone dressed like this, you know? <laughs> and and I, just, I just, women take men seriously in a way that I think we don't take each other seriously. So if he is protects by making this counterterrorism move with that. I think that's extremely powerful. Extremely powerful. Yeah. yeah. Someone just asked me, a young man, um, about the same thing. And I, I don't know why I felt so strong. Like, protect your own purity. Yeah. And in that, you will protect all those that the Lord, like, puts in your presence as a man. Yeah. Like, there, there's an authority there. Yeah. And when you're protected, you naturally protect the femininity of a woman because you're already, that battle's won, the dragon's slain. Yeah. And now you can go forth in freedom and love, you know? Yeah, amen. Yeah. So who are some of the women you think best personify the ideal feminine genius? We talked about Mary. Yeah. Are there others? Or? Oh, my gosh. Mm -hmm. I mean, my, my grandma. Uh, <laughs> definitely my grandmother. Um, my mother, who, you know, uh, I mean, you don't know these people, but I remember being 11 and being a brat in the car and being like, Mom, you really should have not had kids. Like, this is really difficult for you. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, I'm doing the most important thing in the world, by the way. Um, so I just think, yeah, I think Alice von Hildebrand is someone amazing to read. Her book, The Privilege of Being a Woman, is great. I love Helen Alvarez. The women that I've been interviewing on the Endow podcast. I mean, I love Laura, my coworker, is incredible expression of the feminine genius. Um, gosh, there's so many. There's so, so many in the church. Um, I'm sure I'll think of other people later on, but yeah, I mean, the church is just full of incredible, incredible women. Um, so, like, can you think of anybody? There's so many. There's so many. They're just thinking of, like, my, my mom. Yeah. My grandma. I feel like the highest expression of people. Yeah. Constantly. Yeah, exactly. Okay, let's keep going. What are some ways that ladies may inadvertently suppress the authentic masculinity in guys <laughs> around them? Any suggestions how to safeguard against that? Okay, yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Not from personal experience, just like what I've seen. Um, <laughs> shoot. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> try not to be so blunt. Um, don't be controlling. We so want to like fix and change men. Chesterton says this really well. Is it an orthodoxy or everlasting man? I can't remember, but he's just like, in public, a woman and a wife is just like, her, her husband's like biggest fan. And then like behind closed doors, she's like, and this is what needs to change. You know, um, so I think, I think there's a charming way 
that women can be that presence and that provocation toward the feminine genius or toward the masculine that can inspire the feminine genius to call them to, to nobility to knighthood without trying to fix and control um i think for it's hard for women guys like we just see all the problems so clearly right away you know um <laughs> And we need to just gonna sound patronizing, I don't mean it that way, but like we just give you time to catch up to it. And I, I think reading, I interviewed this uh, evangelizer, Bill Marcotte, because he read Moliere, Student so Tatum, right when it came out. And it changed his marriage. You know, he was a good Catholic guy with a nice Catholic wife and a good Catholic family. But he read that document, and he's like, John Paul II didn't write this for women, he wrote this for men, right? <laughs> and he stopped seeing his wife as a competitor of power and started to really trust in, in, in her feminine genius and to rely on it and to make it his own. Um, so I don't know, if, I mean, I, I would say, and the other thing is, and this is harder than not controlling, if you could even imagine, um, <laughs> vulnerability with asking for what you need. I think men love to help women with their, need, with their problems and their needs. Um, and I think J, John Paul II, when he says like the t to not give into the temptation to imitate male models of domination, I think one of one of the most vulnerable things for a woman is to admit her vulnerability, which she is, you know. And I, I was talking to a male friend about this. Like I, when I go speaking here and there, I always have to think I have to make sure my flight lands at a time that's not late. I have to make sure somebody picks me up or that the Uber driver isn't creepy because I've been in a lot of creepy taxi cabs. <laughs> Um, those are things I have to think about when I enter an elevator if I'm alone that men don't. They just don't. So if, if that's, an, that's, an, that's an answer to the previous question about what men can do, like be sensitive to that. I was, at a, I was giving a talk recently where all of the organizers were like, oh, father, do you want to ride? Oh, father, do you need a ride? Oh, father, do you? I'm like, they don't need, they're dudes. They don't need help. I'm a single woman here. You can drive me, you know? Uh, you know, so just like being a, paying attention and taking it seriously, most women won't take their vulnerability as seriously, and they certainly won't take their needs as seriously. But I think if you give men a chance and say, hey, I, I need this from you, this is what it will provide for me, and to be simple and clear about it and kind, I think they can't wait to jump into it. So that's my answer. Yeah. No, I agree about the vulnerability because it goes two ways, right? Fear and turn into criticism. Yeah or into an authentic growth experience. Yeah, right? yeah. All right, how do you stay in your femininity when you don't feel safe in a situation? So kind of what you were talking about, yeah. like how to stay in that when you're feeling unsafe. Um, how to stay in femininity don't feel safe. I mean, I've never thought about that. Mm -hmm. Great I guess I'm not even thinking about my femininity when I, when I don't feel safe, mm -hmm. I think. Don't worry about it. Stay safe. Uh, you know, I mean, what th the point, borrow from John Paul II. And I never thought about femininity until I started working for a doubt. I kid you not, I never did. Um, I thought it was like a made up thing. I was like, really? Like, why do I have to think about the feminine genius? And Paul, so as an Armenian, Egyptian, it's a total ma matriarchal. Like, the women are in charge. I'm like, I don't need to talk about this. <laughs> uh, so, I learned. Um, but I think in those situations, just, you know, you can't be philosophizing about your femininity. You just have to stay safe, you know? And that's part of the feminine genius, too, right? What John Paul II says, if, you're, if you are a woman, you are expressing yourself as a woman, regardless of what you're doing, right? When people would ask Edith Stein when she'd lecture around you know, Europe talking about women's stuff, you know, can, can women be engineers? It was like the stupidest question for her. She's like, women can do anything a man can do, but they're not gonna do it like a man does it. That's the point, that's the point. All right, how would you suggest going about teaching young girls and boys about authentic femininity in the midst of today's confusing culture, especially in girls who feel shoved into stereotypes, whether they're girly or tomboys? Like, how do you educate? God only knows. I mean, it's so bad. It's so bad. And it's demonic. Mm. When there are gender reveal parties for elementary school kids changing mm. their gender. I mean, this is like a level of spiritual warfare 
And John Paul II said the third millennium was gonna like, triple spiritual warfare compared to the 20th. I'm like, really? It's gonna get worse than the world wars? Uh, okay, and the genocides. And I mean, I don't know what he was thinking or what he was exactly prophesying about, but I, I, I think we have to double down on spiritual warfare prayers. We must. And there's no room for lazy philosophy or confusion about the church's teachings. There's no more room for it. Everybody has to like double down, get educated, be able to speak intelligently about sex, about gender. I mean, Edith Stein was thinking about these things in the 1930s, right? This is prophetic, right? John Paul II later on, right? So now we've got to take up the work that they've done and we have to make it known. But I, I, I do think there's this love. So, and the other thing is, yeah, just reinforcement of our dignity. I mean, I was at a, I share this story a lot because it just really impressed on me the, the crisis. I was at a family party, and I didn't want to go because I hate small talk. You know? <laughs> and uh, my dad's like, great, you don't want to go, I don't want to go. I'm like, no, we're going. Family. <laughs> and I was like, look, Holy Spirit, can you just make this interesting for me? Like, I, I just, it's got to be interesting. I just can't do this. And then my cousin said, you know what? I hope that the family doesn't put all the pressures on, you know, a, a male cousin of ours to, because you know Middle Eastern people, he's got to be a doctor, a lawyer, you know, and um, pressures with career and pressures with getting married and pressures with all this kind of stuff. And I said, wait a minute, because when people say things, it's not really about somebody else, it's about themselves. I was like, oh, Holy Spirit, is this what you're going to have me do? <laughs> I take it back. I don't want to be used. This is scary. Uh, and I said, look, cousin, um, just want to check in. You do know that your dignity lies in simply being a child of God, a daughter of the king. And that no matter what you do, whether you fail or lose at life, whether you get married or not, all of that is accidental to the substantial reality that you are unconditionally loved by God who loves you into being right now. And she, like, tears started, like, not crying, like, spilling out of her face. <laughs> and then she said, nobody has ever said that to me. A lifelong Catholic? No one's ever said that to you? It's important for these things to be said. You know, uh, parents can say, you, you know I love you. But children need their parents to say, I love you. Um and you have dignity, and you are worthy, and this is where your value lies. And yes, you're gonna be tempted to define yourself by the work that you do and the money that you make and how popular and how much people like you and how, how much you're codependently people-pleasing this week, right? Like, it's all there. <laughs> but it's, there's gotta be some part of you that at some point, the part of you that knows that you're unconditionally loved by God, that part has to win. Mm -hmm. Jesus has to be bigger than, I, than our idols because our idols are there. And they will always be there. He has to win in the end. Amen. So I think saying it, and then I think the Christian thing has to happen. What's the Christian thing? I'll tell you what the Christian thing is. When I, I love being Catholic. I didn't know a thing about it, but I love it. Um, and I went to church, and I like God, and I like religion, and I like learning. I liked it all, and I, they still lost me, by the way. I mean... I like this stuff, and I still left the Catholic Church. That's how bad it's been in America, okay? So I was like, i got to go where Jesus is. Clearly he's not here. Um, and I was trying. And I met, I met Catholics who were happy. This is a super early church. I met happy, celibate Catholics, some celibate, some not. Happy families, happy celibates. And it was so weird being around them because I kept ask, I kept wondering, what do they see in me? Why do they want me to be around? What do they want from me? They must want something from me. You know, I don't have anything to offer. And I and then it just like hit me. I was like, oh, oh, this is like totally gratuitous love for my destiny in my life. They don't need or want anything from me. They just care about me. And, I, and I, I remember that moment. I was like, oh my gosh, is this what Christianity is? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, because I would thought that Christianity was following the rules, and of course God loves you too. That's different. 
that's different than a completely gratuitous, unconditional, can't pay me back, love for my life. That's what the pagans experienced because there's no reward for Christians endangering their lives during the plague in the first century to take care of their pagan neighbors. And that's what I experienced in 2007. And that changed me for the rest of my life. That's the Christian thing done well. That has to happen. If that can happen in your home, then you will be, then you will all, we will all step into our personal vocations, which is spiritual fatherhood and spiritual motherhood. And the existential orphanhood is deep. I mean, there's so much crying out for love. Children are cutting off their parts to scream out for acceptance and love. It is so bad. Uh, Pope Francis said that, beautifully, he said that to accompany someone out of existential orphanhood means you have to take them on a pilgrimage through Christ to the Father. Anything other than that is sentimentality. And our world's so filled with sentimentality. Just good emotions, supporting all sorts of evil, right? Or the other extreme, which is just like harping on the rules in a really rigid, unempathetic, unintelligent way. But if we're really going to truly accompany people in these ghastly situations, they've got to feel and know and encounter that gratuitous love. And you have to take them uncomfortably to the next step with Christ, slowly leading to the Father, which means being able to speak the truth in love and the love in the truth. So I hope that answered that question. So good. Yeah. Thanks. Is there any other questions here that you guys have for Simone um, as we wind this down? Is there anything on your hearts? Or Yes, actually, I do have a question. I was interested in the statistics you mentioned about women leaving at age 23. Oh, every, then, everybody at 23. Oh, is it? By, 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 by 20. The women. So I was wondering what the reason is why. And then you said the average 13. Yeah, so um, the reason, one of the primary reasons, is the lack of the intellectual life. That, that young people don't think the Catholic Church is smart. This is the church that built Western civilization, right? <laughs> the scientific method, the university system, champagne, beer. <laughs> I mean, there's like so much on our resume, okay? So, but, but if, and parents freak out. Parents talk to me all the time about like, my kid's asking really hard questions. I'm like, you don't have to be like an oracle with like a PhD with all the You All you have to do is say, Oh my gosh, what a, what a brilliantly challenging question, son. <laughs> Let's discover the answer together, right? Because the church already has the answers. It has them. And you just get to be on an adventure with your children, taking their questions very seriously, you know? Um, I get women who email us at a job and say, could you convert my niece in, you know, Nebraska? <laughs> like, no, <laughs> you get to do that. I'll help you, right? I'll I I will be I'll be your backup. I'll tell you what to st read, what to study, where to go. But you're the one God has chosen for it. But that's one of the main reasons is the intellectual life. Um, there's a great document uh, a great documentary you might love called Outreach to the Unaffiliated. It's put out by Bishop Barron and the Word on Fire. It's about a 25 minute video. It's going to outline more of the reasons why people are leaving. Okay, outreach to the outreach to the unaffiliated. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Really good documentary. All right. Well, Simone, thank you so much. I think she has a little video for oh, us. Oh, yeah. This is a uh, just if you. I've never so shamelessly promoted a DAO at a talk, but I, I, it's a crisis situation. This is a great tool. Okay, so this is a little commercial. John Paul II once said that woman has a genius all her own, which is vitally essential to both society and the church. As a busy mother of two, my desire for my prayer life is that not only do I take the time to pray, but I also infuse the peace that God gives in prayer into my actual daily life. I'm always trying to grow in holiness. I pray a lot for rootedness, community of people that I trust and can connect with on faith issues. To become an instrument for others 
to help them grow in their relationship with the Lord. In different places I've lived, I've been the only Catholic woman my age that was trying to live by certain church teachings, and I felt very alone at times. The great need that I've seen in myself and other women is the need for a real life community. So not online social media, not sharing images, but actually like real life conversations. And Dow brings women together into small group communities to study the intellectual tradition of the Catholic Church. We organize women into these small groups, provide and publish study guides for them to be working through together in an eight to 12 week session. Magnifica is in Dow's apostolate to Hispanic women. It's our study guides translated into Spanish. We as women want to know about our nature and dignity, and we want to know about the intellectual tradition of the church. And so that is what sets Endow apart from any other program or organization. A woman in an Endow group is living a full Christian experience because she's living the life of faith in community. And she's also being formed and molded by the teachings of the church. Women in colleges are constantly being fed lies about the hookup culture. We encourage women to get new groups started and then to reach out to organizations like schools, pregnancy resource centers, and get groups started there because that's really where the women are in desperate need of the message of the truth. Start an endow group and invite women because most of the time there are other women just like you who are looking for friendship and who are looking to learn. Why now is so important for today's culture in which we see that women are, I would say in some way, misunderstood, sometimes manipulated, and we risk to lose the genius, the beauty of women. And, uh, and I think this is a message important for everyone to hear. My Endow group over the years has gotten so close and we have shared each other's highlights in their life and sorrows in their life. And we're there with each other every step of the way. It has reminded me and put a clear place in my week that I need time for community and people and time for intellectual formation. My first study for Endow was John Paul's Second Letter to Women, and it was really special because it was with a group of women that I didn't know that well. I feel like I grew in knowledge of myself through learning from different lenses. They were women in much different background and how we grew together as a group. It teaches me about the lives of the saints and how we are made for truth and for love. The more that you get to know Christ through each other, through the presence of the other, the more you're going to be attuned to the Holy Spirit's voice and call in your own life, in your own particular mission. I would strongly recommend Endow Groups to any woman on any part of her faith journey because you get to delve into the intellectual tradition of the church, which is always exciting and never ending. So you're going to learn so much about who you are, about who your fellow sisters in Christ are, that you're just never going to want to stop learning.